Uh, we're here today, February 12, 2016, at the Northwest Washington, D.C., home of Debbie and John Hanrahan, to interview Paul Kunstler, one of the most influential figures in the Washington, D.C. gay rights movement for well over 50 years. The interview is part of the Lessons of the 60s project of the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, Peter Roof is filming the interview, and Ann Galvan and myself, John Hanrahan, will be asking the questions. Before we start, a few brief words about Paul Kunstler uh, and looking at the gay rights movement in Washington, D.C. No one aside from Franklin Kameny, the founder of the Mattachine Society, has had a bigger impact over the years than Paul, uh, from the board of the Mattachine Society to the first gay rights protest at the White House in 1965 to the establishment of the Gay Activist Alliance and the creation of the Griffin Stein Democratic Club. Paul is in the forefront of the local movement in the 1960s and 1970s and right on down to the present day. And we'll hear a lot about all of those sure. things today. Welcome, Paul, and let's start off Thank by you. asking where you grew up and your parents and their influence on you and then move right into when and why you sure. gravitated to Washington, D.C. Yes, well, I'm Paul Kunstler. I was born in Detroit on Friday, December 26, 1941 and grew up in Ghost Point Woods, Michigan, a suburb on the east side of Detroit. Uh, I had ten brothers and sisters. Um, I grew up in a large Catholic family, um, but my father was a member of the United Auto Workers before he we went into management, and so we were working a class um, family in Gross Point Woods, which is uh, not at all um, uh, typical of Gross Point. And I had a paper route, D delivered the Detroit News and, uh, on Rosslyn Road initially, and as you went down to the, the street, the houses got bigger and bigger until they had servants. You know, then there was Lakeshore Drive where um, the Fords, all, all the Fords lived. So, anyways, I uh, went to St. Joan of Arc grade school in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, and Notre Dame High School in Harper Woods, Michigan, and graduated in 1960. Um, in 1947, my father bought a television set. Uh, initially, only the National Broadcasting Company was on from 4 to, f to 8 p.m., but later um, uh, television came on to its own right. I watched the 1952 Democratic and National Republican National Conventions, gavel to gavel, and again in 1956. In 1956 in Chicago, the Democratic National Convention, after former Governor Adlai Stevenson was renominated, he threw open the floor to the delegates to the selection of the Democratic, the candidate for Democrats, uh, for Vice President. Uh, Senator Estes Kefauver was expected to be the, the nominee but Senator John Fitzgerald Kennedy challenged him and nearly won, and that's when I began to follow Kennedy's career. Um, as you know, on January 2, 1960, uh, Kennedy announced his candidacy in the Senate caucus room. Um, uh, and after he was nominated in July in Los Angeles, on Labor Day Eve, 1960, that was September 4, 1960, he flew from Anchorage, Alaska to Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Uh, th that was the days that there was no security at the airport and you could go right out by plane side. And he first, uh, after his plane, Caroline landed, it was about 10.30 at night and I was with my sister Donna he first got into his car with his aides. Then he got out of the car and climbed up on top of a baggage rack. And I was directly below him and reached up to shake his hand. Uh, later, a, we, a few minutes later, we stepped a little bit further and then the Detroit News took a photograph of John Kennedy standing in that, on that baggage rack. And you could see my head and my sister's <laughs> head at the bottom of the photograph. Uh, on 5.35 a.m. on uh, November 9, 1960, Kennedy carried Michigan's 20 electoral votes, and with those electoral votes, he won the presidency mm -hmm. of the United States. 
And you had worked for Yes, us. and I had worked. Um, mm -hmm. my, my friend Dennis Wren, we both graduated from Notre mm -hmm. Dame High School. We formed Gross Point Young Democrats in support of John Kennedy's election. I also worked uh, at the um, 14th Congressional District Headquarters on Alger Street in Detroit, and mm -hmm. often uh, going door to door. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in some African-American um, wards. Um, uh, after the uh, election on Tuesday, um, April 17, 1961, um, Dennis Renan and four other members of Gross Point Young Democrats left Detroit's Michigan Central Station at 5 p.m. on a special Baltimore Ohio train. Earlier that afternoon, the other section of that train had left Chicago's Union Station. In Ohio, the trains were merged and everybody was going to John Kennedy's inauguration. Mm -hmm. We next we arrived the next morning at 9 a.m. at Washington Union Station. Uh, that evening, I attended the Young Democratic Inaugural Ball um, at the Mayflower Hotel in the Grand Ballroom. About 8 p.m., Lyndon Johnson showed up with Lady Bird Johnson, and then a little about 8:30, Bobby Kennedy showed up. Um, about 8:30, and talked about how many people were in town. Um, I had um, on New Year's Eve, um, after uh, uh, we had um, given um, a party for the Gross Point Young Democrats at my grandmother's house on Piper Boulevard. She had a large house, two door, uh, the second house from the Detroit River. Uh, on New Year's Eve, I went down with Dennis to clean up. It was in my grandmother's basement. And then I decided to go to Toledo, Ohio on a Greyhound bus that evening. And I arrived about 11 p.m. Uh, in downtown Toledo at the Greyhound bus station and came outside and two young men came by and said, we just arrived from Hollywood. <laughs> I thought I must be the, in the place. So I walked around uh, Toledo. Uh, for and you had gone specifically to Toledo because... Yes, because I had heard that gay people go to Toledo on New Year's Eve. Right, right. Um, I actually had an encounter with a woman who was pimping her daughter. <laughs> but 11.50, I came around the corner and I saw this big neon sign that said, Bar. And I, I thought, maybe this is the place. And so I walked in, it was very crowded, and I sat down. And all of a sudden, there was this drag show that started. And uh, I sat next to two young men. One of them was a swimmer on the U.S. Navy swimming team. And then he they asked me, would you like to go to another bar? And I said, sure, why not? Um, you could drink 3-2 beer in, in Ohio in those days at 18 and get into bars. Uh, so we went over to the Scenic. It was on Monroe uh, uh, Avenue in downtown Toledo. And I walked in and everyone was just like me. And that's when I came out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So you came out about the same time you got involved in politics. Uh, Correct. Since so yes. so you were 19 years old, yes, on the cusp of your life, and you show up in Washington D.C. Correct. A recently acknowledged gay man. Yes. <laughs> um, the previous Sunday, mm -hmm. um, I was at, at the scenic bar, and the bartender gave me the names of two bars: the Pink Elephant. And Carol. This is in D.C. Yeah, D.C. Because okay. well, I told him I was coming to Washington, mm -hmm. uh, uh, leaving on Tuesday evening for um, the um, John Kennedy's inaugural. So, uh, about close to nine o'clock, I left the bar, the ball at the Mayflower Hotel, and got um, a cab, and I went to the Pink Elephant, which is in the Harrington Hotel. It's now. The bar is still there, it's called something else. Mm -hmm. um, what I remember about that is I saw my first colored television. <laughs> and the colors weren't very good, but it was 
I had never seen a color television before. And then I went walked over to Carol's on 9th, 9th Street, which I wasn't particularly impressed with. And then I went back, and uh, the the ball was breaking up. And uh, uh, anyways, uh, the following evening, now I had arrived without rooms. So on Wednesday afternoon, after we had arrived at the Mayflower Hotel, I went out and knocked on doors here in DuPont Circle and, and got three rooms uh, where we had two women and four men. And Dennis and I stayed at 1711 Q Street mm -hmm. Northwest at th for three dollars a night. It was on the f yeah. fourth floor. Yeah. Um, Sunday, uh, Thursday evening, about six o'clock, this was January 19th, 1961, I was walking down N Street and it started to snow and there were a group of young nuns uh, attempting to take their groceries in and they invited, I helped them and they invited me in and uh, for a cup of hot tea and we talked. Um, uh, it started snowing all night. Anyway, so about 11 o'clock, I w went into the Copper Skillet. Uh, it was a coffee shop at 36, I'm sorry, at, at Inn and Connecticut Avenue. And I noticed there were a lot of young gay men in there. And I introduced myself to Doug T Tate and Jim Trice and got invited to my first gay party at 1731 New Hampshire Avenue, which was an apartment house and is now the Carlisle Suites. And and guitars. And so um, um, the following evening, which is John Kennedy's inauguration night, um, I met up with Doug Tate and we went to um, the Georgetown Grill and the Chicken Hut and then we went, I guess we went by cab to Johnny's at 8th and E and those were the first three major gay bars in Washington in 1961 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, um, I was so excited about Washington um, that Dennis had to talk me into going home the <laughs> next day. We did um, uh, Saturday afternoon we went to the Capitol grounds and uh, then the inaugural, inaugural platform was on the east side of the Capitol and I stood where John Kennedy had given his great inaugural address the previous day when he said, uh, ask not what you can do for your country. Um, anyways, um, I went home and I was working in E.J. McDevitt's Religious Goods and Card Shop, a Catholic in, at Eastland Shopping Center. In April of 1961, I saw a full page ad for books in downtown Detroit and I saw there was a book called The Homosexual in America so on my day off from, um, uh, from work I went took the Lakeshore Line bus downtown to, to buy the book and it was Donald Webster Corey's 1961 book The Homosexual in America. I came back to Washington in June 1961 uh, again on the uh, Baltimore Hall train and stayed at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel at 15 E Street uh, Northwest, which I know, I believe it's called the David Hotel now, which is very upscale. Uh, at lunch, I met Doug Tate for lunch, I think on a Thursday. And after lunch, I went into another bookstore, into another bookstore and I saw uh, Jesse Stern's uh, the Sixth Man, he was a journalist and wrote about the spread of homosexuality in America. So then I learned that there was a gay rights movement from these two books. Uh, I also came back to Washington again, this time on, on United Airlines, of September 30th, 1961, and stayed at the Statler Hilton, which is now the Capitol Hilton, at 16th and K Street. And um, this was the time you came back to stay, or no, 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 that wasn't yet. Not. And after I had returned um, in uh, October, November, I decided to move here. And 
So on Thursday, December 28, 1961, I moved to Washington and stayed at Hartnick Hall at uh, 21st and P Street for $25 a week, including breakfast and, d and dinner. But I found the place to be unfriendly, so I moved over to um, um, a rooming house at 17th and Q for $15 uh, a week, and I took my meals at Shows Colonial Cafeteria, which was on Connecticut Avenue on the west side of the street, north of K Street. And you could buy all these nickel dishes. And so I had breakfast for 15 cents, lunch for 25 cents, and dinner for 20, 35 cents, and I splurged. It would be 55 cents. Yeah, and that, what you told us about it brings back the time when D.C., particularly in this neighborhood, was rooming houses. And Correct. So, so a young person could come here and didn't have to have a top paying job the way you would today, almost to be a young people and young person and move here. Yes. Um, in January of 61, just after New Year's, I started to look for a job. Um, I believe I saw an ad in the Washington Post and I went over by bus to Arlington, Virginia to an employment agency and they sent me to Union Trust Company, a bank at 15th and 8th Street, Northwest. Um, now, they had an agreement with uh, Union Trust that would send only white applicants. Um, there was a lot of racial um, discrimination and um, uh, openly expressed prejudice in Washington. Um, in those days. Um, Can you give us an example? <coughs> for instance. Something you noticed as a white guy from the Midwest coming to Washington, how blacks were treated? What's an example? Of yeah, well, as an example, Union Trust only employed Caucasians. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, I, uh, after I started uh, working at Union Trust, I went to uh, a banking institute. It was a, uh, a school on 17th and Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, and the first night that I was in the class, the instructor, um, and there were only white students, he took the, uh, told this racial joke, which was, I was yeah, really quite amazed. And he said, oh, the, the Washington Post was a communist newspaper. So. Um, uh, but in February of, of 1962, I moved out to Silver Spring, Maryland, and I shared a one-bedroom apartment with this young Jewish guy, his name was Paul Levine, and he worked for a Giant. Uh, and um, so I, I lived out there for four months. Um, but on Sunday evening, uh, February 25, 1962, I was at the Chicken Hut at 1720 8th Street Northwest. Lafayette Chicken, it was part of uh, uh, D'Asandro's Italian restaurant and bar. And the mezzanine, when you went upstairs, was the gay bar, and Howard was at the piano, and he died at the piano. Um, uh, Bill Fly, F-L-Y, he was the manager of the Chicken Hut, and he knew I was interested in the movement, so he brought me over and introduced me to Dr. Franklin Kameny, uh, who was then 37 and uh, was president of the Mattachine Society, the district's first gay rights group, and uh, had an apartment at the, in the Adams Morgan, Morgan neighborhood at 2435 18th Street. Now Frank invited me to attend the next Mattachine Society meeting. And on Tuesday, March 6, 1962, at Earl Aiken's apartment, I became the 17th member of the Mattachine Society. And the following uh, month, on Tuesday, April 3, 1962, I was elected to its board of directors and was the only minor then involved in a tiny gay rights movement consisting of about 150 people in five American cities of Washington, 
Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Nothing in Chicago or no. Uh -uh. Nothing. This was really the only gay organization. That's right. Kind of gay rights organization. Yes, right. there was the Mattachine Societies of Washington and New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco, the Janus Society of Philadelphia and the Daughters of Validus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the late Barbara Giddings was one of the founders of the Daughters of Validus. Um, anyway, she was in Philadelphia. Yes, yes. she was in Philadelphia. Right. On, um, in the first days of June of 1963, I did a transcontinental Greyhound bus trip from Washington to San Francisco and crossed the San Francisco Bay Bridge at dawn on June, Thursday, June 6, 1963. I stayed at the Golden Gate YMCA on Golden Gate Avenue. The next afternoon, I went to see Hal Call, who was president of the Mattachine Society of San Francisco. Uh, Hal Call sat in his uh, second floor Mission Street office on that lovely Friday afternoon and complained to me about a man whom he had never met. He said, that Frank Kameny, he keeps using the word homosexual openly. Doesn't he know that we should remain quiet and allow the civil libertarians to speak on our behalf? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very. So, and what what did you respond to him? Well, I, you know, I was very interested. He, uh, he also gave me a, a court of appeals brief. It was a large blue book, mm -hmm. and they had one the right of uh, to send um, what was called homophile literature through the mails. Uh, and that was one of their major accomplishments. Uh, the other uh, major accomplishment was Dr. Evelyn Hooker of the University of, of, of California. She had done a study where she um, examined, uh, did a psychological study mm -hmm. of about 20 well adjusted, seemingly well adjusted heterosexual men, and also of about 20 seemingly well adjusted um, gay men, and uh, uh, she gave the results to her colleagues, and they were unable to determine who was homosexual and who was mm -hmm. heterosexual. Their, their philosophy in San Francisco yeah. was really that the professors and the civil libertarians yeah. would be the outcome. Well, that was the. Yeah. Uh, uh, the early movement, right, and right. Kameny. Uh, Kameny represented the second phase of the development of the gay rights movement. Um, in um, the early si in the 1960s, there was a total prohibition of gay men and lesbians working in both the federal and the district governments. We were also denied security clearances for um, the. Uh, for government related jobs and the American Psychiatric Association um, uh, classified homosexuality as a mental illness. Mm -hmm. Now, um, on the first Saturday in April of 1963, uh, a group of us uh, traveled to Philadelphia. Bruce Scott was secretary of the Mattachine Society in his blue Corvair. Frank Kameny and Robert Bellinger, who was vice president of the Mattachine Society. And we met, there I met Barbara Gettings, um, who was um, the most influential person in Philadelphia at that time in terms of the gay movement. Um, after the um, planning, con this is, we went for a planning conference for the first ECHO Conference, which was East Coast Homophile Organizations, which was held, um, held the following uh, September at the Drake Hotel on Walnut Street in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, Bruce Scott and I drove to um, New York and we stayed in an apartment of a friend who was away. And uh, the next afternoon we drove back. Um, uh, 
in his blue Corvair and we stopped off to pick up Frank Kennedy. A series of incidents happened to me and I wrote a short story all the way home uh, about uh, that trip home and how it related to the gay rights movement. It tells the story about Frank Kameny and the late Bruce Scott, who was fired from the Department of Labor because mm -hmm. he was gay. And Frank Kameny was, had been fired from the... Uh... Uh, um, uh, he um, worked for the Army Map Service. Right. Um, and um, had an arrest in San Francisco and when he, f it was um, uh, written off as a disorderly conduct or something. Anyways, he put that on his application and um, that's how they found out. The great um, question, there's a new book out um, about J. Edgar Hoover and gays. Um, oh, and um, anyways, uh, there's a chapter about the Mattachine Society. When I read that, I realized that had Camley not put down on the application that he had this disorderly conduct in San Francisco, he might never have been lost his job and his whole life would have been different and the gay movement would have been different because he m may never have been part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so. and and maybe this is a good point, just to talk sure. a little bit about his influence in those early days and, sure. and what the movement owes to him. And yes. Correct. Et cetera. Yeah. Um, of course, he had, a, uh, Frank had a, he was a, a, a PhD from Harvard in, ast in astronomy. Um, and um, as I was he was a scientist and um, was enormously self-confident person um, and he had uh, challenged his uh, dismissal and even wrote his own brief to the, to, um, the Supreme Court and when he uh, that was denied he he and the late Jack Nichols founded in, 19, in November of 1961 the Mattachine Society of Washington and they had their first meeting at the Hay Adams Hotel, which is at this elegant hotel across from Lafayette Park mm -hmm. in November of 1961. Um, um, uh, Frank um, was, uh, he always insisted, you know, he was about that we are the authorities. We are right and they are wrong in terms of the government's uh, position on, uh, on whether gay people were suitable for federal employment. Um, uh, I had, um, on Friday evening, April 16th, 1965, um, Camley called me at my apartment um, um, on Capitol Hill at 521 7th Street Southeast and told me there was going to be a picket the next day and that I should come and meet uh, at 330 at the small Triangle Park uh, at um, Pennsylvania Avenue 8th Street and 8th Street Northwest. So, uh, the next morning I went downtown. I remember being at Union Station and watched all the buses come in for the first anti-war demonstration arrived and I went downtown to buy this poster board um, and I made a poster um, that said 15 million homosexuals protest federal treatment. Mm -hmm. Now when I got to um, uh, at 3.30 um, at uh, the uh, Triangle Park, it was across the street from the Roger Smith Hotel uh, Jack Nichols saw my poster and said, I want that poster. <laughs> and not b knowing better, um, I gave it to him. We w then w marched down F Pennsylvania Avenue, down into the front of the White House. And I looked across the street 
and there was this cluster of about 30 f news photographers standing at the corner waiting for the um, uh, the red light to turn change and they crossed the um, the uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and started photographing us and I was it so unnerved me I kept hiding my face behind there were more of them than there were uh, yeah there were because there was only ten of us there yeah. were seven men and three women I'm now the only male that's surviving now uh, there's a famous um, United Press International photograph which um, I shall show you later. Mm -hmm. It shows Jack Nichols carrying my poster, <laughs> followed by a tense Frank Kameny, and then Lily Vincennes, who lives in Arlington, and then behind her is me. And then you could see t the two women, one of them was Gail Green, and then Robert Ballinger, who had an apartment on 17th Street. Um, and we, we, um, our picket was from 4 to 5 p.m. We had it at that time because um, of the anti-war demonstration was held earlier that uh, that day mm -hmm. in Washington. Um, you, and you found out, I think, in the last couple of years that there was an ABC yes, film ABC crew that's television posted on uh, uh, online. Uh, yeah. yeah, I had television cameras there too. I just found that out recently. Uh, the African, um, um, the newspaper here, uh, the Afro-American, yeah. they ran the story too. Um, but um, what, it's probably just because of my interest in the press background. Was Kameny uh, fairly good at uh, mobilizing the press? And I actually, um, or is this just a flu? He told me uh, that they hadn't made any attempt to to notify the press. I think it was Jack Nichols who must have notified the press because there were a lot of press there. I mean, mm -hmm. there were three times as many press as there was. Uh, uh, um, of us, there were only 10 of us. So. Mm -hmm. um, in May and June, uh, on a Saturday also, we also picketed the uh, State Department and the U.S. Civil Service Commission. Uh, part the, then we were sending out press releases and Secretary of State Dean Rusk was asked at a press conference about our f coming pr picket, and he said that, uh, well, as you know, homosexuals are not suitable for federal employment, or something, yeah. something to that effect. And, and that was the issue that yes. the movement was focusing on yes. at the time. Yes, correct. Right. Yeah. That's right, because um, it was nothing unusual for you to come home at six o'clock and you could be working in a private enterprise and find two members, two men, men from the Office of Naval Intelligence on your doorstep wanting to take you to the Navy Yard for questioning. Now in July of 1605, uh, they picked up my late partner, Stephen Brent Miller. Um, uh, and uh, he had, um, uh, I should back up and say, um, on Friday, uh, March 30th, 1962, I met Stephen at the Chicken Hut. Apparently it was about 11 o'clock that night and um, he was 19 at the time, uh, was going to classes at Stenotype Institute of Washington to learn to become a Stenotype court reporter and was working in the Capitol building on the staff of House Appropriations Committee, and he had an apartment at the Congressional on Independence Avenue um, Northeast. Uh, and I walked him all the way home to his apartment. Um, and then we had um, our first date was on uh, Sunday, April 6th. 1962, we met at 16th and Harvard Street and went to uh, services at All Souls Unitarian Church. Dean Hollett was the um, pastor then. I remember him uh, saying that the only people who are young at 40 are presidents. Of course, John Kennedy was president. And um, we went to see a film that afternoon at RKO Keats Theater on 15th Street, which is where the um, Old Ebbett Grill is now. Um, it was um, The Children's Hour starring right. Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine based on Lillian Hellman's play, which was from the 1930s. 
Um, anyways, after that, we took the DC Transit bus, which is the president was Oroy Oroy Chalk out MacArthur Boulevard to Frank Kameny's housewarming party. Um, he had moved um, in March of 1962. He had moved from his apartment to 5020 Cathedral Avenue, the house he was renting from the woman who owned, who lived next door, uh, a house that he eventually owned and, and where he died on Tuesday, October 11, 2011. Uh, when we got there, Frank said, oh, you're early. But he invited us in and then he showed us his garage. And what I remember of, about that day is that on the garage floor, there were the ingredients for the punch for each hour, all ranged out on his garage floor. <laughs> it amazed me. Uh, uh, later that week, I talked to Frank over, over the phone, um, and he said, he told me about the reaction of the woman next to us. She said, who were all those men? <laughs> um, now you were with your partner for yeah. yes. 50, 60 years? Uh, so over 42 years. 40, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, when he died on, in George Washington University University <laughs> Hospital on Sunday, July 18, 2004 at 7, 10 p.m. Yeah, we had been together just over 42 years. Mm -hmm. um, um, in, on, on Friday evening, uh, we had bought, Steve and I had bought a Volkswagen in April of 1964 from a Volkswagen dealer dealership on Rhode Island Avenue Northeast for $3,000. Um, and on Friday evening, uh, July 2nd, 1965, we drove to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware for the weekend. But on Sunday morning, uh, July 4th, 1965, I left Rehoboth Beach in a suit and tie to drive to Philadelphia to participate in the first gay rights picket in front of Independence Hall, uh, where there were 40 people. Um, and then I drove back afterwards and, um, and joined Stephen at the Avenue Restaurant on Avenue on Rehoboth Avenue, um, and there I met uh, Richard Davidson, who, uh, he worked for the federal government, and I was telling everybody about my experience in Philadelphia, but I noticed he was very nervous, because he worked for the federal government, and then he later became a close personal friend of ours. Um, um, last July, um, July, Thursday, July 2, to, um, Sunday, July 5, I was in Philadelphia for the 50th anniversary of that picket. Uh, and there were three of us uh, survivors of the f original four people. Randy Wicker, who now lives, he's 78 and lives in Hoboken, New Jersey. John James, who lives at the uh, LGBT retirement home on 13th Street in downtown Philadelphia. Um, I was in, uh, sat for an hour uh, PBS documentary. Um, I was also sat uh, for another half hour documentary, also in Philadelphia. Is that shown? Um, they just contacted me, uh, hmm. uh, PBS, about photographs. And I told them where they could get some photographs of me and Kameny uh, at the Washington Post and at the New York Times. Um, no. And um, um, on um, Friday, July 3, uh, I was at Independence Hall for the Boston Pops, of uh, Philly, Philly Pops concert. And Michael, um, um, Mayor Michael Nutter introduced me, had me stand, and the th we, had, we were VIPs, the three of us. And um, uh, I was also back the following morning for the national concert at Independence Hall, mm -hmm. and again, which was televised by ABC nationally, and again I was introduced by um, uh, Michael, uh, Mayor Michael Nutter. Mm -hmm. 
as the 60s went on, did there come a time when you observed or you were part of a, a change that suddenly from a relative handful of people there were... Correct. And how did that... Why was that? And well, gradually we mm -hmm. acquired more members of the Mattachine Society. Mm -hmm. um, in 19, the summer of 1965, uh, I met Bill Donovan, who worked uh, for the gas department, I think, you know, at the time, and um, he became a member of the Mattachine Society. Bill, uh, who is retired now in California, was born in Germany during World War II, and his father was a a German soldier who died on the Russian front. Uh, his mother re remarried uh, a gay man, built up, his name was Donovan, um, who was in the army. Um, Bill uh, started attending uh, Mattachine Society meetings, but um, apparently the Office of Naval Intelligence, they went to his father at the Pentagon and told him that his stepson was attending Mattachine Society meetings. So, um, uh, across the street from the Chicken Hut was at 1720 H Street. With, at 1717 H Street, the Central Intelligence Agency had an office, which I found out in recent years. And Frank told me that people were being photographed coming and going from, from the Chicken Hut. And, I now know it was the CIA who was f photographing people, um, which I found out through a friend of mine who I'd worked. like to ask you something more about Frank Kameny sure. and, and uh, Mattachine Society. Sure. You had mentioned that he, Kameny and Barbara, Barbara get, get, get Gittes it. were key people in forging Correct. the philosophy behind Correct. the movement, that early movement. What was the philosophy yeah. of Mattachine and the well, philosophy The two of them um, laid the philosophical foundation for the gay rights movement. Kameny coined the phrase, gay is good. Um, we, um, uh, well, for example, um, at the first ECHO conference at uh, the uh, Drake Hotel in Philadelphia. The ECHO was the umbrella organization, yeah, right? Yeah, East Coast Homophile Organizations. Yeah. It was the three organizations in Philadelphia, New York, and Washington. Um, okay, uh, Saturday night, um, uh, our banquet speaker was a prominent psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Albert Ellis. He arrived with a young woman under his arms and proceeded to tell us that we were all m mentally ill. Now, um, Camry sat in his chair and absorbed this, but um, uh, a, a young lesbian got up and protested. But that began uh, a 10 year struggle against the APA. Um, uh, now, the following um, year um, at the ECHO conference at the Sheridan Wardman Park Hotel, Kameny uh, was in charge of the program. So anybody that represented the views that, uh, that homosexuality were, was a mental illness were excluded. Uh, I didn't meet two prominent um, members from the Kinsey Institute, Wardell Pomeroy, and another one um, uh, that afternoon. Um, also, um, we got visited by a, f a member of the American Nazi Party. Um, he showed up in full Nazi drag and had this box with a big red bow and s started screaming that he um, had a, a large jar of Vaseline for Rabbi Eugene Lippmann, who was one of our speakers. He got arrested and taken away. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyways, um, the following year at the Barbizon Plaza um, uh, in New York in um, October of 1965, um, we had the third conference. Um, and Lily Vincennes, who lives in Arlington, had taken uh, films of all the of all of our pickets and. Uh, showed them. I remember um, 
members of the uh, leadership of New York Mattachine Society walked out because they didn't approve of Kameny's, you know, his tactics, you know, of, uh, of confrontation. Um, but um, at that, but there were a number of um, of California gay people, men who showed up at that conference. One was Jim Foster, um, who uh, later founded the Alice B. Toklas Gay Democratic Club, and he was a delegate to the 1972 and 1976 Democratic National Convention. And at this, uh, the 1972 convention, he delivered a speech on gay rights for the convention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we also, um, Kameny and uh, David Carliner founded the National Capital Chapter of ACLU. And um, ACLU represented uh, Bruce Scott in his challenge um, uh, in the courts. And we initially won uh, a case in the Court of Appeals, but later had to go back and refight it before we did win it. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, you could get picked up. Now, um, in, in July of 1965, Stephen got picked up by two men men from the Office of Naval Intelligence. He wasn't at all cooperative and did not cooperate. They thought he was still working on House Appropriations Committee, but he had left there and was working as an independent contractor and a stenotype court reporter for Hoover Reporting Company on Massachusetts Avenue Northeast, a company that he later acquired when it became Miller Reporting Company. Uh, anyways, they also picked up another friend of us, Don Crawford, uh, who worked in private enterprise, but he had a security clearance. But Don, unfortunately, they were looking for information by a, a friend of ours, Perry Redford, Redford, who was a lieutenant commander in the Navy. Anyways, uh, Don Crawford told them what they wanted to know, um, and Don uh, lost his security clearance and lost his job. And Perry Rutherford lost, got kicked out of the Navy and moved back to Philadelphia to Rittenhouse Square, where his mother was living, and then uh, Don moved to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, you would, uh, the government would say, you have been charged with notorious, disgraceful, immoral conduct, but the government never provided in the information about their sources, you know, or never explained anything, you know, that was what you were faced with. Did you ever suspect yeah. somebody in your ranks was writing people out uh, um, to the government? Well, th that's why uh, we all had pseudonyms. Okay, yeah. In the, um, in the, um, in the Mattachine Society, uh, I initially picked the name David LeMay, but that confused everybody. It was an, a, a guy that I knew from the Woodward Bar in Detroit in 1961. And so I changed to Paul LeMay. Paul LeMay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. And you said Frank Kameny was the only one who really used Yes, his, his own name. His correct. Own name. It may have been that Bruce Scott used his name too. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, anyways, um, Sometime in the late 60s, though, there was a, a major uh, shift. I mean, you were picking up uh, members, but then there was also uh, gay liberation. Uh, yes. Um, right. Let's let's move into how Stonewall and the you know the next generation sort of changed the correct. scene. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the I, aftermath of uh, the John Kennedy assassination. And the reaction to the Vietnam War, uh, there was a great social upheaval, mm -hmm. uh, not only here in Washington, but around the country. Um, and um, in 1965, I initially supported the Vietnam War. In 1966, uh, I was, became neutral. By March of 1967, I, uh, I remember there was some incident that happened. I became of uh, gradually extremely active involvement in the anti-war movement and went to all the uh, anti-war demonstrations. I was also involved in the early civil rights movement on 
Wednesday, August 28, 1963, I was a participant in Dr. Martin Luther King's March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. My father uh, had been was a member of the United Auto Workers. So on that uh, Wednesday morning, I marched with the UAW down Constitution Avenue, and I was on the left-hand side of the reflecting pool underneath the, um, near the temporary World War II buildings when Dr. King delivered his great I Have a Dream speech. Uh, there were about 210,000 people had come to Washington or from Washington at the time, which was the largest congregation in Washington since General Grant marched with his armies after the Civil War. Um, and I, you know, I had gone to all the, the civil rights protests here in Washington. Um, now, um, I, um, in 1968, I went with, in um, February of 1968, I went on a bus from Georgetown University with students to New Hampshire to campaign on behalf of Senator Eugene McCarthy, who was the anti-war candidate. And I went back twice, I drove the next two weekends in my Volkswagen to New York, uh, to New Hampshire. Um, of course, um, uh, McCarthy got 42% of the vote in New Hampshire, um, which was startling um, development because he wasn't supposed to get more than like 5 or 10%, which caused um, uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, to decide not to run for re-election. Um, anyways, um, then I went I went to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana in May of 1968. On a Sunday morning, I was driving students downtown Indianapolis and Bobby Kennedy's car pulled up right behind, right next to me, you know, and he was, um, it was actually on this side. And I could look over and see him so closely. I could see the blisters on his lips. He was sitting in the middle seat with four other men. Um, and then 10 days later, he was assassinated at the Ambassador Hotel on, oh, actually it was early in the morning on June 5th, 1968, and died in Los Angeles on Thursday, June 6th, 1968. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, now, um, as, as far as, uh, I just wanted to get back to uh, D.C. and the um, the uh, gay rights movement, and correct? The, uh, what the gay activist alliance and the yes, correct. club and uh, yes, and, correct. And the political oh, yes. action with in support of Marion Barry in an early uh, yes. election. Yes, in um, January of 1971, I supported uh, Reverend um, Channing Phillips. He was a Unitarian minister, minister at All Souls Unitarian Church. Uh, the Mattachine Society, which I was no longer part of, had sent out a questionnaire. Frankly, it was Franklin Kameny. It had sent out a questionnaire to all the candidates. Uh, I found out that um, that Channing Phillips did not refuse to respond to the questionnaire, and so I quit his campaign. And um, and then um, um, and then on that Tuesday. Um, Reverend Walter Farnway won the Democratic nomination. This is for the non-voting seat. The first time that uh, district citizens had an opportunity to vote for something other than for president, mm -hmm. which we started voting in 1964 for president. Mm -hmm. um, the following Saturday, I was at a, a GLF dance, which was at St. Mark's Episcopal Church on 2nd Street Southeast. And a friend of mine, Alan Hofford, who worked for the Department of Agriculture um, in, um, he was a communications officer, was there. And he gave me this memorandum about our running Frank Kameny for Congress. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it was a two-page memo. And Alan, 
underscore things with his green pink, his um, uh, his green pen. And uh, but you know, I I knew or he you know pointed out there was going to be all these televised debates and all this media experience, but we had to get the signatures of 5,000 registered voters mm -hmm. to put Camney on the ballot. And I thought, well, that's impossible. You know? But the next day, um, on Sunday, um, we gave a brunch for our friends. One was Richard Davidson and his partner, Lynn Burnett. And they both worked for the federal government. And I, I suddenly remembered um, Alan's memo he'd given me. And I asked them, would you sign a petition to put Frank Kameny's name on the ballot, fully expecting that they would say no. And mm -hmm. when they said yes, I was like, wow. So um, I called Kameny about it, and then he said there was going to be a meeting of, of the Gay Liberation Front on Wisconsin Avenue and Lower Wisconsin Avenue on Tuesday. Um, this is in January of 1971. So I went to the meeting and I was astonished to, f to come in this, and there must have been 200 young gay men at that meeting. I thought, wow, this is really a change. So the following Friday, I uh, had an organizational meeting at my apartment at 240 M Street. I think it was Friday, January 19, 1971, uh, to, uh, to organize Frank Camley's campaign. David Carliner and another attorney showed up from the ACLU and tried to persuade us not to do this. Apparently they thought it was too early, premature, but we decided to go home, go ahead. Um, so we began the process of collecting signatures. I recruited three student, gay students from Georgetown University uh, to, and then we got, a, um, somebody lent us a small office in Thomas Circle. Um, and we worked out of that, you know, on Fridays, on Saturdays and Sundays, collecting signatures. Um, we got some students who come down from Pennsylvania to work with us. Then I got this idea, having gone to New Hampshire, you know, I was campaign manager, uh, to, uh, bring a busload of members of the Gay Activist Alliance of New York down to Washington. And so we brought them on a February, on a Friday evening on February of 1971, because the following Monday was the deadline and we were, had collected 3,800 signatures by then, but we were not near these, uh, the uh, go of 5,000. So they came down and it was very well organized. Two of them stayed with Stephen and me, and you know there were all, all people who stayed in their other people's apartments. Dick and Lynn took two, and you know. Mm -hmm. And the next day, uh, they, you know, were out on, at Safeways and everywhere mm -hmm. collecting. On uh, Saturday and Sunday, and uh, Sunday evening, um, uh, we gave a party for all the volunteers. It was at Temple Sinai, and it was also a gay liberation uh, event. And I arrived, and um, we had the signatures of 6,300 signatures. Now, um, previously, um, um, uh, the morning that we were to announce, I got up and turned on the radio in my apartment at 240 M Street, and I heard this voice and said, a new candidate today will swish into the political arena. And um, uh, I went down to the district building. Alan Hofford, who was the journalist, had arranged for all the press, and there were all these television cameras were there. And Cameron uh, said that Queen Victoria is dead, and the Pilgrims are long gone. In his speech, so, which was you know all the mm -hmm. all the evening at six o'clock, eleven o'clock, was that sound bite. So you, uh, to jump ahead just a little, yeah. the, the election, uh, he performed quite well, well the election, um, surprisingly on, well. On yeah. Monday, um, March 22nd, 1971, 
uh, Tony Jakubowski, uh, who was our treasurer, called me at my office. I worked, was purchasing agent for Serter Mattress Company in Landover, Maryland. He said we got a check in the mail for five hundred dollars from actors Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Um, and then the next day, uh, I worked at Precinct 89 at Jefferson Junior High School. Uh, Camney got 1,888 signatures, but in Precinct 89, where I worked, he got 11%. In, um, in Foggy Bottom, he had 8.5%, and in DuPont Circle, he had 5%. It was the beginning of gay political influence in Washington, and uh, the major thing that happened, though, um, the larger community and the media began to refer to not individual homosexuals, but the gay community. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, then that influence later manifested itself um, with the formation of the uh, Gertrude Stein Democratic yeah. Club. Well, for, first of and all, tell um, us about that. And yeah, about how Mary and Barry yeah, okay, came yeah. for support. Um, we had a, a surplus of about eight hundred dollars left. Most of it was the Newman, mm -hmm. um, uh, Joanne Woodward money, um, and I bought some clothes for Frank. Um, but then we used the six of us to travel to New York, I believe, for train tickets to meet with Gay Activist Alliance of New York to form Gay Activist Alliance of Washington. Um, uh, and um, yeah, th that became um, uh, one of the uh, Jim McClard, who was one of our, became the first president of Gay Activist Alliance of Washington. Um, not, I don't believe he's still living. So, anyways, um, Joel Martin, who was the, uh, who's in real estate now, he was the second president. Uh, later, I, I began to. Uh, you know, to realize that we need to have a vehicle for develop political influence within the Democratic Party. As I mentioned earlier, my friend Jim Foster founded the Alice B. B. Toklas Gay Democratic Club of San Francisco. So on a Thursday evening in January of 1976, we met, met at my, in my living room at my townhouse at 745 Third Street to form Gay Act, the Gertrude Stein Democratic Club of Washington, which is now both organizations, which which I helped founded, are still very much in consistent in in existence. Um, gay and Lesbian Gay Activist Alliance, when we had our first lesbian president, became Gay and Lesbian Activist Alliance, which is now the oldest surviving gay rights organization in North America. Um, in uh, March of 1975, David Goodstein, who was publisher and owner of The Advocate newspaper in Los Angeles, called an invitational conference at the Chicago O'Hare Hyatt Hotel, Hyatt Regency Hotel. Uh, there we founded the Gay Rights National Lobby. There were 15 men and 15 women on that board, and I was um, on the board. Um, and um, um, and Cammy and I and a few others uh, basically incorporated the organization here in Washington. Um, in uh, now later, uh, Stein endorsed Marion Berry. He came to May, you, right? Yeah, yeah. He came to us. He had been on the school board, and then uh, later became very active, um, very supportive of gay, the gay community. And so, we endorsed uh, Marion Barry for mayor. Um, and um, in September of 1978, the um, he was running against. Mayor Walter Washington and Sterling Tucker, who was chairman of the city council. Um, Barry was ex expected to run third, but in the, uh, the Washington Post on the Saturday before the election, um, the district writer, 
I remember he wrote a story, it was called Gay's Hope to Cast Deciding Votes for Barry. Uh, on election day, um, when the first returns came in, he was, Barry was leading by 500 votes. He eventually won by 1,500 votes. I did an analysis of 20, about 20 precincts where there were a substantial number of gay men or lesbians who lived, and Barry got from 50 to 65 percent of the vote. In all the other precincts in the city, he ran a distant 30, distant third. Mm -hmm. um, so we had been. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, um, so that and that really opened people's yes, eyes. Yeah, and correct. To the power yeah, of the political that's right. Yeah, wow. really. Yeah, and and, and um, from that day forward, yeah. everybody wanted the endorsement of the, of the Stein Club. Club. Yeah, yes. that's right. Correct. Um, yeah. Also, um, um, in September of 1978, Kameny told me that there was this guy from Minneapolis, Minnesota. His name was Stephen M. Dean. Um, that we should hire him to be the first executive director of the Gay Rights National Lobby. So he arrived on the Wednesday after, the day, that, the day after Marion Barry won the primary for mayor, which he essentially won the election because it was tantamount. And he became the first executive director. I was founding treasurer of uh, Gay Rights National Lobby. We, in turn, founded the Human Rights Campaign Fund, and I was founding treasurer for that, which became the Human Rights Campaign the national, which, national, national Organization. And also there was another organization, for f the Fund for Fairness, and I was founding treasurer for that. Um, um, and October of 1982, we had our first fundraising dinner at the Waldorf Astoria in the Grand Ballroom. And uh, Walter F Monday, who was vice president under uh, Jimmy Carter, was speaker, and the late actor Tony Randall was speaker. And that was our first fundraising dinner. Looking back over this incredible um, life, um, yeah. is there something you're most proud of, what any advice you give to gay activists or activists of any stripe uh, today? Uh, well, as, a, um, as really a founding father, if you will. Correct. Um, uh, you know, I say that you, know, that you need to believe in yourself. Um, the very essence of gay liberation was that gay people started stop believing in the whole social indictment and started believing in the integrity of their lifestyle. And that became the essence of uh, gay liberation. Um, in May of 1968, uh, there was a, a major bar called, a super bar that opened on 8th Street Southeast called the Plus One. Now, uh, it was a Thursday night I had been in classes. Uh, I went to the, uh, the University of Virginia had a Northern Virginia chapter. I went to classes at night and worked during the day. But I got, um, went to the plus one that night after I had gone to classes. And there was a long line of young men waiting to get into the plus one. And all of a sudden I looked up and there was police cars started descending the whole, and there were four police cars, police officers in each car lined the whole block and they got out and approached the plus one and there was really no reaction of people in the line um, years earlier they, they would, people would run away you know but they said well what's off what's wrong officer mm -hmm. so they went back and they tried that again and they went away and, and this happened before stonewall which was the following month and in effect um that was the Stonewall uh, here in Washington, D.C., you know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was an act reaction of the profound change of 
attitudes that occurred here in the, in the gay community. Right. Yeah. Uh, the, um, one of the um, things I'm most proud of, uh, I was founder of the National Convention Project in 1980. Uh, which f secured the passage of the first gay rights plank in the Democratic Party platform. We placed also in nomination Melvin Boozer, who was president of uh, Gay Activist Alliance of Washington. He, he was an African American, placed his name in nomination for vice president um, before the uh, Chicago, the New York uh, Democratic National mm -hmm. Convention. And I was an, one of the f alternate delegates. There were five openly gay members of that delegation. Um, and we elected nearly either f uh, nearly a hundred gay men or lesbians to delegates or alternate positions or members of the platform committee. And I think I'm most proud of that accomplishment because it accomplished everything we set out to do. Mm -hmm. One last question that we always ask our interviewees this long record of activism that you've had since you were 19 or younger, um, how do you think those many years of organizing important things like this have affected the rest of your life? How has the rest of your life been since then? Well, I think it um, made me increasingly self-confident. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, you know, helped me develop leadership skills and uh, ability to speak and and type of that type of thing um, uh, I, I I'm absolutely astonished at the progress that we have made um, back in the uh, in the 60s we would never conceive of the day that there would be laws to protect us from discrimination that there would be openly gay people you know, gay marriage. Gay marriage, and the, and the marriage concept, equality, yeah. was something that like we couldn't even conceive of back then. You know, it was just beyond our our our, uh, our ideas of what could possibly happen. You know, it's been astonishing progress. You know. Thank you, Paul. Sure. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay.